for a, uh, a ministries convention. And while they were there, they had taken the video camera and headed down to the Everglades to get some good nature footage. They were doing some children's memory verse videos at the time, and there's always a need for more nature footage. And so they were headed down there, and they stopped in Avon Park to see my cousin and her family on their way down. And, and when they got there, they went to Wendy's to have dinner. They could get a baked potato and, you know, all those good Wendy's things. And uh, so they went in about 8 o'clock in the evening. They were the only family there. When my mom and my grandparents had uh, ordered and they went to the table and my dad had to go to the restroom and so he went there. And when he came out, there were two men in ski masks that had entered the restaurant. They were shaky and they were sweating. They pulled guns out. And my dad, as he came back into the dining area, he noticed what was going on, and so he did not go sit with the rest of the family. He went and sat at a table by himself. And uh, they came over and, with shaky hands, demanded his money and his wallet, so he quickly uh, hid a couple of 20s and put the rest out on the table. And uh, the manager was kneeling in the middle of the floor in the restaurant, and they ran up and grabbed the, the trays of cash out of the cash register and ran out the door. It was an event my parents will never forget. An event my grandparents will never forget. Fortunately, no life was lost, but nonetheless, it was a traumatic event to get robbed. Let's pray this morning. Father in heaven, we ask that you will be with us here just now. May your Holy Spirit come into this place and fill our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi, really easy to find Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament. So just find Matthew and then just turn back a page or two. All right? Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Now, Malachi, like most of the minor prophets, is not just a standalone book. It's not just one that you read from verse 1 to the last of the the, uh, book and understand it all. It's part of Israel's history and part of the larger set of minor prophets. These minor prophets, many of them minister during the same time period or uh, consecutive time periods, and that's the case with the book of Malachi. So to really understand what's happening in this little book, we also have to look at the larger context of what is going on in Israel's history at this point. The book of Esther describes um, a tumultuous time in the, in the Persian Empire. The king, King Xerxes, was a bit temperamental. If you recall from reading the book of Esther, uh, it was at a party where he kind of lost his cool and got rid of the queen because, well, he got mad at her. She might have embarrassed him just a little bit. And so he deposes uh, the queen, and the search is on for a new queen. We know through Scripture that Esther comes on the scene through a series of miraculous circumstances by divine appointment. Through Esther's ministry, the Jews are saved from an evil plot by Haman, a wicked and proud Persian leader. The date that Haman had set up to be a tremendous loss for the Jews ended up actually benefiting the Jews more than they could have imagined. And this particular date was set in the year 473 B.C., 473 B.C. We next read about the ministry of Ezra in the Minor Prophets. The first dated event in the book of Ezra takes place in 457 B.C., so just about 16 years later. And in the years between Esther and Ezra, we know that King Xerxes was murdered and his son took his place, King Artaxerxes. Because the Persian Empire needed to be on friendly terms with the Jewish nation for political reasons, because they just lost uh, a battle with Egypt and some others, and so they needed to stay friends with the Jewish nation, so they had a road through to go back after these ones they'd lost to. And so, um, because of this, King Artaxerxes lent a willing ear to Ezra. And Ezra had a specific request that he asked King Artaxerxes. Um, He asked King Artaxerxes if he and those who wished could go back to Judea, to Jerusalem, um, and be ruled by Mosaic law, which they had traditionally and historically been ruled by. King Artaxerxes allowed Ezra to return to Judea with all those who desired to return with him. They were able to set up a government with judges and magistrates that could make decisions of life and death. 
Now, while Ezra is ruling, very little is recorded of what took place over the 13 years of his rule there in Jerusalem. And after that 13 years, there was another change. Nehemiah was a faithful Jew. And though he was a faithful Jew, he had also advanced in the Persian Empire. The Seventh-day Adventist commentary tells us that Nehemiah was well-educated, and later he proved himself to be a good organizer. There had been a rebellion um, over in, in some of the Persian territory in 450 and 449 uh, from a guy by the name of Megabizos. One of those fun names like Rick was talking about in the children's story this morning, Megabizos. He was the governor of the land beyond the river, which included Judea. During this rebellion, historians believe that either the Jews were faithful to the Persians and were attacked by the Samaritans, or faithful Samaritans took the opportunity to blame the Jews for joining Megabizos. So either way, the Jewish nation, there were consequences in this rebellion. They suffered during this time. Jerusalem was attacked, and the city took a beating. In 445 BC, just four or five years later, Nehemiah's brother Hanani and some other Jews arrived from Susa and brought a discouraging report of what had taken place in Judea. When this rebellion took place, the, the means of communication were kind of cut off between Judea and the Persian Empire, and, and so Nehemiah wasn't getting good reports of what was happening. And so finally, his brother and some others came from Susa, came from the, the Judean region, and gave a report of what was going on, and it was worse than Nehemiah had expected. Jerusalem's walls had been broken down. They'd been burned. The city was in disrepair, and Nehemiah was beside himself, much like Daniel had been in Babylon. So Nehemiah wept and cried out to God for days. Over the next several months, Nehemiah resolved to do something about this terrible situation. And so he began to work. And, and, and develop things. He developed a plan to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the city back to the way it should be so it could be protected. Some have suggested that because Nehemiah uh, knew the unstable character of Artaxerxes, much like his father, and because of Artaxerxes' love of women, Nehemiah waited until the queen was in town when he knew the king would be in a good mood and then he went to the king and he proposed a plan that, uh, that he would go back to Jerusalem and help build the walls, set up the gates, and make the city uh, viable once again. Now his uh, conniving worked. King Artaxerxes approved his plan, and even more than just approving his plan, he sent Nehemiah as the new governor of Judea. He was to be in charge when he arrived. So when Nehemiah arrived around 444 B.C., he took three days to size up the situation. He didn't go in on day one and say, I'm home, everybody! No, he quietly, unbeknownst to anyone, walked around the city. At night, he would go and survey the walls to see what damage there was, to get a good idea of what needed to be done. For three days, he surveyed the city and its condition. Then finally, on the fourth day, Nehemiah went and talked to the city leaders, told them the situation, and told him that he was help, there to help rebuild Jerusalem. Now, as you can imagine, with any group of people, some people were excited to hear from Nehemiah, and others, not so much. But Nehemiah was so organized that even in the face of great opposition from local political leaders, he was able to repair the walls and fortify the city in only 52 days. It was amazing. He was exceptional in administration. Now, Ezra, if you remember, had already been in the city. He had been there for some time. Then Nehemiah comes in and takes over. And though Ezra, Ezra had already been in Jerusalem for some time, he joined in support of Nehemiah's leadership. And upon the completion of the walls, after those 52 days of reconstruction... Ezra led in the joyful procession with Nehemiah. They actually both set out on the top of the city wall and went opposite directions until they reached the other side, joined together, and went into the temple of God to celebrate this great thing that God had done. Nehemiah then stayed there in Jerusalem for the next 12 years and ruled as the political secular leader. And even though he was the secular leader, 
Nehemiah was deeply concerned for the spiritual welfare of Jerusalem. It wasn't just ruling the city. He was concerned about the people's reflection and relationship with God. He brought about spiritual reform during this time. And upon his completion of that 12-year term, he returned to Persia. Now, we're not told for how long he was gone from Jerusalem, but it must have been some time. He came back at some later date, and when he returned, he found things had declined significantly from the way he'd left them. His arch enemy had been given living quarters in the temple compound. The Levites were involved in agricultural pursuits because they had to make a living. No one was paying tithes and offerings any longer. In addition to this, foreigners were in Jerusalem selling goods on the Sabbath. And pagan wives were once again found in Jewish families. This practice had been forbidden. So this was a great departure from the way things had been when Nehemiah was there last. And it was during Nehemiah's absence that God had raised up the prophet Malachi to correct spiritual sickness among the people. So this is the history, the setting for the writing of the book Malachi, the prophetic ministry of this man we refer to as Malachi. So the Lord starts by speaking through Malachi in the book of Malachi, and he begins by reminding Israel that they are his special treasure, his special people. They're not just run-of-the-mill, ordinary people. They are his chosen people. They're to be different. They are special. God watches out for them, and he provides for them, and yet he points out that the people have not regarded his kindness to them. And they've gone their own way. They have ignored his commands. They have effectively slapped him in the face in spite of all the good that he has done for them. And because of their profane offerings, he does not listen to his people. What a frightening scenario. If you've ever been in a place where you have needed help and the only one who is there to offer help ceases to listen to you, it is terrifying. And that's what Israel has done. Effectively, they have cut themselves off from God. He says, I no longer listen to you. God continues in his message to the people and he condemns the corrupt priests. Those who are to represent God himself are corrupt. God says that they have focused so much on the laws and on their sacrifices, and, uh, or they focus so much rather on the law that their sacrifices and offerings are meaningless. They focus so much on the law that people have simply been forgotten. They hold up the law above anything else. Maybe this sounds a little like what was still taking place several centuries later when Jesus came, right? We had all the Sabbath laws and and all these things to uphold the law and make sure the law was kept, but we forgot about people. And Jesus had to set the people straight when he returned. Then God turns in Malachi to the marriage covenant. He points out that people are to deal with one another with love out of concern because this isn't happening. They're not being treated properly. Jesus says very plainly in Malachi 2 verse 16, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God here is obviously and very clearly speaking of marriage, the closest human relationship possible. He points out that marriage is to be permanent. It is a lifelong commitment. Of course, we know in the Bible that we are given reasons for divorce. There are reasons for that, but that's not the focus of our message today. God continues in the book of Malachi, and he tells the people in the beginning of verse uh, chapter 3 that he is sending a messenger And this messenger will prepare the way for him to come. Now we know this is in the early 400s BC. We know that in a short 400 years, indeed that messenger would come. This is a prophetic message of John the Baptist coming to prepare the way for whom? Jesus. A messenger is coming to prepare my people. Malachi points out that in the days of this messenger, judgment would take place. Malachi writes in chapter 3 and verse 5, he says, And I will come, this is God, I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. 
God says there is a judgment day coming, folks. You can't continue to live life the way you are today. Then God says in verses 6 and 7, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Now this verse either shows complete ignorance on the part of the people or their denial. We must remember that the people had departed from God's principles during this time. That had already happened in the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. And Malachi is now sent to bring the people back. So the people ask this question of God. In what way do we need to return to you? It's as though they're saying, well, we don't know what we've done wrong. What needs to change? Sometimes we do the same thing, don't we? We play dumb. Oh, officer, I don't know how fast I was going. Oh, I wasn't supposed to go in that area? Oh, my bad. We never play dumb, right? And the people say to God, God, in what way are we supposed to change? What are we doing that's wrong? Sometimes we're so clueless, we don't even know what we've done wrong. The Seventh-day Adventist commentary points out that the message of Malachi is particularly appropriate for the church today and is comparable to the Laodicean message of Revelation chapter 3. Like the Laodiceans, the Jews of Malachi's day were utterly insensitive to their true spiritual condition. They felt their need of nothing. They were poor in heavenly treasure, blind to their errors, and naked or not clothed with the perfect character of Jesus Christ. Like the man in the parable without a wedding garment, They stood before the king of the universe despising the garment of his righteousness and fully content with their own moral rags. Maybe this is reflective of you and I today also. Do we know where we have fallen? Do we know where our shortcomings are? Do we know where we are lacking? Or are we comfortable feeling pretty good about ourselves? I'm a good person. God should be happy to have me on his team. Now, God doesn't hold out on his people. They ask the question, he gives the answer. And he says in verse 8, he says, Will a man rob God? Now, remember, they said, In what way have we failed you? In what way have we gone wrong? He says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. He makes it very clear. God doesn't beat around the bush. If you remember, one of the issues that Nehemiah found out about in the visit from his brother Hanani was that the priests were involved in agricultural endeavors. Now you may say, what's wrong with that? They can get their hands dirty, right? They can work a little bit to earn their keep, right? But if you remember, the priests were not given an inheritance because they were not to be out doing agricultural work. They were to be provided for by the rest of Israel who paid their tithes and their offerings. That was how the priests were to be taken care of. The Levites were to be blessed by all the abundance that God gave to everyone else. So the issue was, the priests had to do agricultural business because the people were not being faithful. God says, you have robbed me. You're not doing what I asked you to do. This needs to change. And God doesn't take this lightly. He calls it robbery. Now, if you were to choose this afternoon to go down to the store and and steal a TV, what would happen to you? I mean, they're just going to say, oh, well, shucks, they got away with one. Is that what's going to happen? You walk out of there with a 75-inch TV, what's going to happen? There's going to be somebody knocking on your door if you make it that far. Okay? There's going to be a penalty to pay. If that robbery is bad enough, you will end up in jail. It is no light matter. And God says, you have robbed me. This is a very serious indictment. Now, we don't know the reason for the change in the hearts of the people. But the devil had been able to weasel his way into the lives of men and cause them to rob God. You see, every dollar that you and I get... Every dollar that you and I withhold from God is one less dollar that the devil needs to worry about. 
to go and further the gospel. Now, you may not have thought about it in, this, in these terms before, but it's still true. When we fail to give to God what is His, we are thereby paying the devil. We are strengthening His side. God addresses this issue with the people through the prophet Malachi. And amongst the claims that God has against His people was that they were being selfish with what He had given to them. They were withholding their tithes and offerings, and we don't know why they were doing this. Maybe they felt they didn't have enough to live on, so they had to keep it to survive. Maybe they were just getting comfortable and wanting to amass wealth. Paul addressed that item with, the, uh, with the, the New Testament church in 1 Timothy 6. He says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Maybe this is what was going on in Malachi's day. But it's true, isn't it? Money can corrupt. Not just its physical presence, but even the desire for money. How many times do people do things to get more money, thinking that they can get something else that will give them joy? Now, though we don't know the reason why the people have withheld their tithes and offerings, we know how God felt about it. He makes it very clear. He says in verse 9, he says, You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So God doesn't take it lightly either. It would appear, appear that all the people are guilty. This is a widespread issue. It's not one person here and one person there. It's big enough that God says, you as an entire nation are cursed. Now, before you throw your hands up in frustration, notice the promise that God gives. He says in verses 10 through 12, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that you will not have room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So we see both opposites here. Uh, opposite ends of the spectrum. He says, you are stealing from me. You are robbing from me. And you are cursed. But if you will be faithful and give, I will bless you. You notice how there's no middle ground here? There's no middle ground. There's not, oh, you can keep a little here and give a little there and you'll be okay. Either you're stealing and you're cursed or you're giving and you're blessed. It's very clear here in this passage. Now, I know you've heard this passage many times. Maybe you've been turned off by hearing it because you feel like you've been guilted into giving. I want to make it clear this morning that I don't know if you're giving or not. I don't make it my business to go through the records and see who's giving and who's not. That's between you and the Lord. I simply share what is here in Scripture. And if you are sitting here feeling like I'm pointing my finger at you, feeling that you are guilty, I want you to consider that maybe that's the Holy Spirit working on your heart. I don't know what you may or may not be giving. So if you're feeling convicted, if you're feeling guilty, if you feel like my finger is pointing at you, I better hold my finger down. <laughs> I'm not. That's between you and the Lord. Friends, God asks us to be faithful. And sometimes faithfulness requires sacrifice, trial, and even hardship. However, God has promised reward if we will be faithful to Him. After all, it all belongs to Him in the first place, right? Now, sometimes we think of money as the reward. Have you ever caught yourself when you read that thinking, oh man, I need a bigger bank account because I can't handle it all, right? 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 Give me tithes and offerings, and then I'm going to give back to you. And we, we tend to think in the same terms, that if I give my tithe, my dollars, God will give me dollars back. But that's not necessarily true. Remember last week, we talked about that all of our lives belong to God. We celebrate that in the baptism service. We die to self, we are raised in new life in Him. He owns all. And God can bless us in ways much more profound than money. 
In fact, he won't bless some of us with money because he knows you would blow it. Yeah, okay, I see some smiles, so some of you are like me. Maybe don't always make the best money decisions, and God knows what he can trust us with. And he may not choose to bless you with an abundance of cash. You may not get a $50,000 gift next week, but God is still blessing you. God promises that he will bless us, and you can count on that promise. He may bless us by protecting us from attack from another person. He may protect us against economic hardship. Maybe he'll protect us against bad health. Maybe his blessings will be a car that run, uh, runs forever, much past its 200,000-mile life. Maybe he will give us confidence in our workplace. Maybe the assurance of our value in him. Maybe he gives us self-confidence. Maybe knowing nothing in this life can hurt us because we have accepted Jesus and our eternity is secure. Maybe that's the blessing that he gives to us. Maybe the blessing will simply be the ability to smile even in the most difficult of situations. I don't know how God might choose to bless you, but I do know that when we honor Him, He will do what He has promised. Friends, as we remain faithful to God, every dollar we receive can be used for God's kingdom. And when we choose to honor God, not just with lip service, but with our time, with our energy, with our dollars, we are robbing the devil. And that is okay. That is the one way that robbing is just fine. When we give it to Jesus and not to the devil. So as we conclude today, I want to encourage you to be faithful. It's obvious that many of you are faithful, and I want to thank you for that. However, there are some who are struggling with this tithing, this offering concept. Maybe you've given before and you felt that God didn't hold up his end of the bargain. Maybe you were looking for the wrong kind of blessings from him. Maybe you've given in the past, but your job situation has changed, and you don't believe that you can afford to give your tithe and offerings any longer. Maybe you've added to your family and there just isn't enough money left for tithe and offering. Whatever the case may be, friends, I want to implore you to reconsider. I want to encourage you to be faithful. I want to encourage you to set aside what God has asked before you do anything else. As Rick pointed out with Melchizedek, Abraham gave a tenth of all the spoils of war before he gave it out to the four kings. Set aside your tithes and offerings before anything else. Make it a priority in your financial planning. Trust that God will take care of you when you honor Him. I want to encourage each of you today to remain faithful to the Lord in all things, including your money. As Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Friends, let's rob the devil today. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your blessings. Lord, we pray that we will be faithful to you in all things, in what we say and what we do and how we use the resources that you have given to us. We pray, Lord, that you will bless us, that you will help us to see your blessing when it comes in forms other than money. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray you've been blessed in your time with us this morning. We want to invite you to stay now for Bible study. Kids' classes are on this side of the building. We have an adult class here in the sanctuary, one in our chapel, and one in our fellowship hall. May the Lord bless you. We look forward to seeing you tonight at 5 o'clock for Pathfinder Investiture.